I usually like to thank the organizers for inviting me, but today I really wanted to thank the Renlands. Um, I think uh, being brave enough to share what happened to them, the tragedy that happened to them and shine a light on this issue is incredible. Um, let's be honest, I think uh, death and especially sudden and unexpected death is a hard thing to even think about. Um, it's certainly hard to hear about. It's a hard thing for me to talk about, um, but people need to know. Um, and I wonder whether maybe we should have uh, kind of re removed this word um, in the title, you know, what you need to know. It should just be, you need to know. Um, this is a really important piece. So uh, here goes. And I think um, one of the things to say is that there are more questions than answers in this area. Um, I think the most poignant questions are going to come from the families of people who are lost uh, to suit up. So um, we don't want to hear that question of how did I not know about this, because there are many people who who didn't. Um, I like to hear from Ed that he said he did know in the back of his mind. I don't think uh, many families are as lucky. Um, you know, why didn't somebody tell me and, and what caused this? Um, and, and hopefully being aware of this, we can um, answer those first to um, and people don't need to have that, but, but we still need to do a lot of work to get to the third. So um, what we do know, there, there, let me be honest, there are not studies specifically in SUDEP in our community, in the autism community, but um, you can't have SUDEP unless you have epilepsy. And we do know something about autism and epilepsy. So let me tell you what we do know. Um, the frequency is that the textbooks will tell you about 30% of all individuals with autism also have epilepsy. I think it's actually more likely to be about 20%. Those data come from population-based studies, which I trust a little bit more. Um, in terms of what it looks like, unfortunately, there's no one seizure type. Um, and I think we all have seen depictions of on movies or TV, the, the generalized tonic-clonic seizures um, or what some people call grand mal seizures. They're not subtle, you know about those. Um, but, but there are other seizures such as focal seizures or um, what we call petty mal or absence seizures um, that often can be hard to differentiate from behaviors in individuals with autism. So a typical focal seizure might be a period of unresponsiveness where the child doesn't answer to their name. Their eyes may get deviated from one side, you know, to one side. So they're kind of looking like they're peering out of the corners of their eyes. They may do something repetitively during that time, like a stereotypy, we call them automatisms. So many of those things look like behaviors in autism. Um, so sometimes the, the more subtle ones can be missed. Um, they can start in early childhood or late adolescence or even early adulthood. And thankfully, they're usually not too hard to treat. What do we know about the risk factors? Well, certainly uh, intellectual disability um, increases the risk. Um, being a girl increases the risk. Um, and having some other problem, some syndrome, some uh, early brain injury, genetic syndrome that predisposes probably both to the epilepsy and the autism. So in terms of thinking about SUDEP, this is the one of the many definitions that, that I found. Um, it is a fatal complication of epilepsy. It is as named sudden and unexpected, but it has to be not caused by something else. So not traumatic, not drowning, um, not a drug overdose, not some other anatomy problem, somebody who got pneumonia and died from pneumonia. This is really something where a person with epilepsy is found dead and they don't know why else it happened. So how frequent is it? Um, I would say this is actually a moving target these days as the awareness is, is increased. Um, I like to choose the numbers that come from the American Academy of Neurology. I'm a neurologist. 
Um, and our guidelines say one in a thousand adults per year and one in 4,500 children per year. I'm a pediatric neurologist, so I like that idea that maybe the kids are at less risk, but there are more recent data that say maybe that's not true. Um, that it might be about one in a thousand for everyone. And I think the other important thing to note is that it really is probably underestimated. To count accurately, it requires SUDEP as listed as the cause of death on a death certificate, right? And not all coroners or medical examiners really know enough about this. So what are our risk factors that we know about? Certainly uncontrolled epilepsy. Um, so the better control you can get, the, the more you lessen your risk, but it can also occur with infrequent seizures, and that's an important thing to know about. As I told you, there are different seizure types, but having those generalized tonic-clonic seizures or grand mal seizures increases the risk. Um, and even if there are only a few, I think that's another important thing to know. Um, probably increasing age does it. There are a few other things that people have looked at, seizures occurring in sleep. Um, and most people um, are actually found in bed in the morning. This is how SUDEP is discovered, um, often in the prone position, so on their stomachs. So there's some thought about, about respiratory status. Um, missed doses of medication. Um, is that because when you miss medication, you might have a seizure? Um, we don't really know. There aren't enough data to, to make these be clear risk factors. Um, there's some evidence that maybe males are more prone than females. Um, and then we have to think about what causes it. And this is something that's, that's actually under active investigation now. Um, and this probably is more in the last few years than previously. Um, and people are looking at mechanisms of, of such as cardiac, respiratory, and this kind of big phenomenon called cerebral shutdown. Um, which is the idea is that there is a there is a last seizure and that seizure somehow causes a whole cascade of events that instead of just a recovery from the seizure ends in death. So what are we doing about it? Um, again, recently, I would say a lot more. And there are foundations out there. They're doing both research. They're raising awareness. Um, this is where I get most of my information from the Epilepsy Foundation. They have a SUDEP Institute. They have a fact sheet that I put up there. Um, they have uh, a lot of other information on their website. Some of you may recognize this young man, um, uh, Cameron Boyce, who was a Disney star and lost his life to SUDEP a couple of years ago. And his family has also started a foundation. The Cure Epilepsy Foundation has done a lot of work in this area. They uh, really uh, took it on in the early 2000s, but we're funding grants even in the 90s um, and have a lot of great information on their website. And then there have been foundations from, from family members, right? From families who, who uh, lost their loved ones to this terrible uh, uh, problem. Uh, the Danny Did Foundation is uh, one of those and, and has done a lot of work in this area and um, is doing a lot of trying to raise money to, to do some um, work in prevention. So what are we doing about it? Well, one thing is, is education. Um, and this is education both to providers and to families. So I will tell you that um, when the AAN guidelines came out in 2017, this was the first time we were told to tell everybody about it. So I highlighted here, clinicians should, clinicians should. <laughs> Before that, it was really um, up to the provider whether they wanted to tell anybody about this or not. And I, and I would tell you, and I consider myself a pretty good doctor, I wasn't talking about it. I thought epilepsy is scary enough. It's really rare in kids, and I'm not going to scare my patients anymore. And I'm wrong. I mean, that is absolutely wrong. Um, so that's one of the things that I think we're doing a better job now. Um, 
the education to the patients and the families, it turns out they want to know about this, that idea of finding, of having it happen and never knowing that it was even a possibility should never happen to anyone. There was a survey really almost 10 years ago now um, that looked to see how many people, either patients with epilepsy or family members um, had even heard about it and 20 or 30% had not. But then you ask the people who had, and only a very small percentage didn't want to know. Were they happy to know? Of course not, but they wanted to know. And, and um, in preparing for this talk, I watched a lot of videos. There are some really beautiful videos out there on the internet. And, and I will tell you that um, there were some parents that understood the hesitancy, even though they suffered the loss and didn't know about it. Um, there was one mom who said, if you can't prevent it and you can't predict it and you can't stop it, then what's the point of terrifying a family? But she went on to say, the point is you're caught up less off guard. And, and she really felt that many, I heard this over and over, many of the families would have changed what they did. So here are the family education sheets. This is one from my hospital. Um, and this is one from the American Academy of Neurology and the American Epilepsy Society that came out at the time of the guidelines um, that really just talk about it that give you the facts so that nobody is caught unaware. What else are we doing about it? We're trying to gather data because um, that's how we do things, right? This is the Autism Science Foundation. That's how science does things. It does it with data. So uh, Dr. Oren Davinsky, who's gonna speak later on this afternoon, um, has been instrumental in coming up with the North American SUDEP registry. And what it is, is really a collection of cases. And they're collecting the clinical information, the imaging, the tissue, brain tissue, if they can get it, DNA, um, EEG and EKGs, all the physiologic data, and then we'll make that available to researchers who want to be um, involved in this area. So I'll finish with prevention. This is the holy grail, right? And I wish I had better news for you, but the one thing I think we can all know is that better seizure control does it. So if bad seizure control is a risk factor, then better seizure control is going to lessen that risk. So, and some of these are, are modifiable risk factors, right? We talk about that in diabetes, we talk about that in heart disease. So taking your medicine, avoiding the triggers for your seizure, good sleep. We know sleep deprivation is a trigger. But for some people, even doing all the right things, they still have breakthrough seizures. They've got the right doctor, they've got the right medicine, and they still have seizures. So there's lots of interest now in monitoring and kinds of alarms and detectors. They can be high-tech things. They can be um, low-tech things. Um, things as, as simple as uh, having a monitor in the room so somebody's aware of the seizure for nocturnal events. Um, high tech is, is uh, wearable devices now. I've got my Fitbit on, but there are ones that do even more than just uh, detect the movement. Um, but sadly, so far, there's not enough data to say this one works, this one works, this one doesn't work. Think about how hard the studies are to do here. This is a rare event. Uh, we don't know what to do to decrease it. Um, so it doesn't mean that they don't work. It just means that the doctors may not be able to tell you absolutely you want to do this. So the Epilepsy Foundation has a nice thing that kind of says, are you considering a seizure alert device? You know, what's out there? What are we doing? The Danny Did Foundation is doing a lot of interest, is doing a lot of research in some of these detect detection devices. So, so how do we move on from here? Um, I would say to you, I hope you never have to use this information. Um, but now I hope you know about it. I hope you're aware. I hope you talk about it. I hope you talk about it with your provider, if you're a parent, with your colleagues, if you're a provider, um, with your family members. Um, and I hope we all learn more about it. I think you can use the great resources. I think that family members can sign up to be part of the registry. 
um, uh, and and be able to to contribute to the research that's being done. And I would leave you with just a few things to think about. It is rare, um, but it does happen. And when it happens, it's tragic. Um, it's not an easy thing to know about. It's not an easy thing to think about, but it does happen. And, and that's why um, we have this uh, first and uh, hopefully annual uh, Jake Rimland lecture. So thanks. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Spence. That was a really great talk. And as questions were coming in, you were answering them. Oh, good. Um, but I did, so you were answering them as you're coming in. There is a resource on the virtual information table that was put out by the um, Epilepsy Foundation. It was actually a collaboration between some parent advocacy groups and the um, Epilepsy Foundation, and it's called the Seizure Action Plan. Yes. And while it doesn't address SUDEP specifically, it does address the, um, the challenge of, you know, what to do when your, your child or your, the person you're caring for is having a seizure or how to anticipate them or how to manage them and to have an action plan in place. So I just wanted to call attention to that because that resource was specifically um, created for the community for it to be used and uh, they were thrilled when I mentioned that I wanted to put it on the virtual information table so yes I completely agree the epilepsy foundation is just a wealth of information so it's the place I go to I'm not an epileptologist and I Ed, I should apologize I'm also not an expert in SUDEP although Oren's coming on so I hope Dr. Davinsky's coming on and he actually is but he had a more important thing to talk about today <laughs> So um, I asked him if there are some questions I can't answer, maybe he's, he can help us. Yeah, so when, so when Dr. Davinsky is talking about CBD, if you wanna squeeze in a suit up question, feel free. Um, you did mention things like syndromic autism as being a potential risk factor. Um, do you think that genetic screening then would be likely to detect um, some of the syndromes associated with increased likelihood of SUDEP? Is that one reason to advocate for genetic screening? So I think the answer to that is, is yes. Um, so we do recommend genetic screening for everyone who has an autism diagnosis. Um, and I think that's standard of care these days. Um, there are certain uh, syndromes with uh, epilepsy that are more at risk for SUDEP. So something like um, Dravet syndrome, um, which is a, a mutation in, the, in one of the sodium channels um, in the brain. Um, has a very high risk of SUDEP. Um, there, I sit on a, a parent advisory board, sorry, pro professional advisory board for the Duke 15Q Alliance. Um, the kids with duplication 15Q have a high risk of SUDEP, um, a high risk, higher risk of epilepsy than general autism, um, over 50%, um, and, uh, and a high risk of, of unexplained death. Um, and so I think knowing what um, kind of autism you have, if we want to call it that, or what, what that risk factor is, but there are also people who are looking very specifically for genetic mutations um, that are predisposing to SUDEP, not necessarily to autism, but to, to SUDEP. So I think as, um, say, the North American registry keeps going, um, there have been genes associated with cardiac rhythm abnormalities, with channel problems, that kind of thing. We got a couple questions also. Um, one from a family that you saw in your days at Agree. Um, oh and goodness. another one about the, you'll see it in the Q&A, but there was um, some questions about the technology. And I know you touched on the technology. Um, and you may or may not have an opinion, but I'm going to ask you anyway, sure. if there are any particular technology measures or um, new tools on the horizon that you're particularly excited about in terms of monitoring um, epilepsy. I think many of us are excited about the wearable devices. Um, and, and what's really cool about the wearable devices is they actually were started um, to look at kids, kids with autism and their behaviors. 
And um, when they were being um, trialed on that effect, right? Because the thought is, could we predict when, when a child's gonna have a, a, a behavioral episode? Because probably the autonomic nervous system is, is revving up, right? But we can't see it outwardly. So what if, what if you could see it on, on a wearable device? Turned out, that when the person Roz Picard, who's who's kind of came up with these um, with these wearables, she said, "Wow, there's a big spike right here. What happened?" And it turned out it was that the kid had a seizure. So then they took that and took it into the epilepsy monitoring unit at Boston Children's and sh showed that there are ways to predict whether a seizure is going to happen. So these are actually on the market now. Um, and I think I think those are very, very exciting.